is Albert Altman. I'm going to be the chair for this session on rovers for Mars and lunar exploration this morning. Um, we have, I think, a very broad list of talks that will uh, introduce a, the spectrum of what uh, is actually happening, what is planned to happen in those in the domain of rovers for planetary exploration. Um, the first presentation is my own, um, so I'll introduce myself. <laughs> I'm the Deputy Project Scientist uh, for the Mars Exploration Rovers mission that you may have heard about from Bob Gianni at the uh, plenary session this morning. And uh, I'm going to tell you in more detail than he did about that mission and how it's going to work, and what the instrument payload is, and so forth. My co-authors on this talk are the Project Scientist Joy Crisp, the Science Manager John Callis, and the Principal Investigator from Cornell University, Steve Squires. The follow-on plenary session, the context for this rover mission to Mars is the Athena payload that was developed for the Surveyor 01 lander, um, which then, originally when that was proposed in 98, that was to be a uh, rover payload entirely, uh, which it has since become again, uh, on a roving mission in 01. That then, after that, has been turned into a payload on a lander, uh, combined with portions of the payload on a small sojourner-sized rover that was known as the Athena Precursor Experiment, or Apex. After the failure of the 98 missions, the redesign of the Mars program led us to the, um, the concept of Mars Geological Rover. That was one of the proposals for um, what to do with in, in 2003. One of their various proposals, one was to fly the was to fly the 2001 lander in 2003 as it was without any changes. Uh, another one was to fly an orbiter uh, in 2003, and the third one was to fly a large-sized rover. This is perhaps actually JPL proposed this as the riskiest but most exciting of the options, and that's what headquarters picked. Um, the selection of one rover occurred in July of 2000, last year. Then they gave us two weeks to study the concept of sending two rovers based on the idea um, that the scientific appeal, I'm going to quote from the then Mars program director Scott Hubbard, um, the scientific appeal was such that sending two rovers in the 2003 launch opportunity, the um, celestial mechanics are almost optimal for getting payload to Mars. As so, even so, we still have mass problems, but we always have that in space missions to planets. Um, they picked two, so we're doing two. The Mars Exploration Rover Project will send two rovers to Mars, launching in 2003. Deliver them to the surface with the Mars Pathfinder Heritage Landing System. Carry on each rover a set of six instruments that will explore the Martian surface in detail. We're going to have capability on each rover to traverse a kilometer. The arrival time is just after the New Year in 2004. So we'll still be recovering from the Rose Parade in Pasadena when we get to work on this. And we will conduct science operations with each rover for 90 sols. Um, some key, key features of the flight system. And I forgot my laser pointer. I apologize for coming out. That'd be great. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> key features are the Pathfinder, Mars Pathfinder Crew Stage Heritage that will get us there. One of the main differences is, and here you see how this all fits together, inside the tetrahedron that has the airbags and the pathfinder it is the rover. The rover is the spacecraft. The brains of the rover that drive on the surface of Mars are the same brains that actually fly the crew stage to Mars. We have the same propulsion system. We're using low-mass composite rocket tanks to improve our mass position. Um, the back shell, the aero shell are uh, strengthened but from pathfinder heritage. We're using Mars path, uh, Mars Global Surveyor Communications. Uh, heritage. The parachute had to get bigger because this rover is big, uh, about 170 kilograms each rover. The whole payload is actually heavier. We need larger rad rockets. That's not good. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just going to go to the rockets. This turns on. What happened? Yeah. Backup system. <laughs> so are we going to a lower bit rate? Uh, unfortunately, we are actually going to a lower bit rate. That is exactly correct. Let's see, where was I? I was still on this. Um, 
Yeah, that might help. <laughs> Let's see, I'll give it to you in order. Or I'm messing them up. Okay, yeah, they'll be in order starting there from now on. Thank you. And we need to focus that big time. You need to roll it forward. Yeah, roll it forward. Parachutes release, 
um, after sufficient deceleration of the parachute, the heat shield's released. A, um, the, the lander is dropped on a tether below the heat shield parachute combination. A radar altimeter senses the surface at um, an appropriate elevation from the surface. The airbags are inflated. After airbag inflation at the right elevation, the retro rockets are fired to stop the vertical um, descent. <coughs> A modification we've made on Pathfinder is we now we're going to have the capability to also zero out or reduce any some horizontal velocity as well. This is what it will enable us to um, have a higher landing mass. One of the issues, if you come in tangentially, you scrape the, the heck out of those airbags. We want to avoid that, so we're going to reduce the horizontal motion, and that way we can have a heavier payload and get these great rovers to the surface. We land, we bounce, probably several dozen times. <coughs> Um, this time we're going to record the accelerometers all the way to stop, not just 60 seconds. And the airbags then deflate, um, exposing the tetrahedron which unfolds. And this whole process takes, can take from about an hour up to several hours. We have direct view to Earth by the X-band link. If this hasn't come back on yet. Oh, uh, we have direct communications to Earth by, by the X-band link and then the final stage is we also have the relay by the MGS further this orbit we're going to change for this purpose so we wanted to survive. This is um, the pictures you saw at the plenary this morning had slightly different solar panel configuration. We haven't gotten into the artwork yet with the new solar panel configuration, but we, this is the baseline design at the moment with these, uh, I guess it's uh, some people call it the F-117 stealth rover configuration of the solar panels. We need the extra area to have enough power. As I explained, the sun is moving away from Mars during the course of the mission. The packaging is very tight to get this 175 kilogram rover inside the tetrahedron the Pathfinder used. We have, in fact, expanded that, that, that tetrahedron slightly. We can't do a lot because every little expansion needs to increase in the parachute size and canisters. It's a, it's a zero sum game. Um, it looks like we'll get this thing to work, and it's huge compared to Sojourner. Sojourner was the size of a microwave, that's a common analogy. The scaling is basically the wheel scaling. Sojourner's wheel size was 13 centimeters. The Mars Exploration Rover wheel size would be 25 centimeters. That's about the scaling in all directions of this rover. The other conceptual difference is that the, um, the rover is a lander. Every time we move this rover, we're at a new landing site, in effect. We won't, unfortunately, be able to see the rover move like we could for Sojourner, but the bonus is, every day we move, it's a new site. That'll be very exciting. Next slide, please. What time is it? What time is it? 45 minutes. Okay. And, slide See how it goes. Oh, next slide, please. This mission is very much science driven. We have objectives that range from characterizing the rocks at the two distinct landing sites that we're going to pick, um, where we'll investigate the history of water at those sites by looking at water and minerals, um, geomorphology of it related to water. And the, uh, the final goal is perhaps we can extract clues from the geologic investigation that's related to water to determine what kinds of past environments have, were, were present on Mars and if those environments were conducive for life. Um, some of the specifics, we're going to look at the distribution of minerals, rocks, and soils, determine the nature of the geologic processes that act on the surface, calibrate orbital remote sensing so that we can better understand how the reconnaissance orbiter and how MGS and Mars Odyssey orbital information extend our understanding of processes on the surface around the planet. We need to have that ground truth in a few places to do that. What we'll do very, very specifically is identify what are the iron bearing minerals. Why is Mars red? It's rust, but what, what is that rust? What exactly are those minerals? And that will tell us a lot about um, the geochemical processes that are in fact on the surface. And that's the same thing. We will have this microscope that was mentioned to look at the textures of the rocks. I should point out, as Bob did, the resolution, and next slide please, the resolution of that microscope is not by any means close enough to detect those nano fossils, possible nano fossils in the animals. Um, meteorite. So how are we going to meet the objectives? We're going to pick the landing sites that show clear evidence for what we're looking for already from orbit. Um, action of liquid water 
in some fashion, and then we use the instruments to characterize the rocks and the clues on the surface. Um, that we're going to pose a hypothesis. We're going to try and figure out, pick a place on Mars where we say we can say water acted either this way or that way from the orbital images. We'll go down to the surface, we'll make measurements that will hopefully prove or disprove one or the other of those hypotheses. We're going to do that in two places. <clears throat> one of the goals is to pick places that have different hypotheses about what was, what was the action of water. Um, we'll study the site's geology and very specific rock targets using um, hyperspectral and infrared and color images, and also then close-up mineralogy using robotic arm. Next slide. Potential candidates, we'll hear some more about this later. Um, the one place on the surface of Mars where we have seen from orbit a unique mineral feature is the so-called hematite region. This was discovered by the Thermal Emission Spectrometer Instrument on Mars Global Surveyor. It is near, conveniently enough, the zero zero of uh, Mars Greenwich and, and is Mars' equator, um, which is about here. And uh, this, this, the extent of this hematite deposit on the surface is large enough that we can easily put down several landing ellipses. Uh, other places we want to go to are potentially our craters that look like they had lakes because there are, there are channels going into them and out of them. And uh, also there are layered deposits that were uh, recently discovered with the Mars Global Survey or high resolution imagery. Next slide, please. In some detail, here's the hematite region. It extends over all of this area. We've got several possible landing sites. The favorite one is this one. Um, and here you see these very sort of gray strips are the Mars orbital high camera high resolution images that are being taken in support of our landing site selection to get coverage at highest possible resolution to uh, certify the sites as safe not having anything that will kill our landers or our landing system and things like this. Another exciting place we're, we're looking at is in Valles Marineris, um, the Valles Chasma site. Um, the, the little opening into Ophir Chasma goes up here, sort of situation on the geography of Mars. Also, we're getting a lot of Mars Global Surveyor imagery to cover this, this landing site. And so far, it looks really good. And believe me, compared to Pathfinder, which already was a room with a view with little mountains and crater rims on the horizon, this will definitely be a room with a view. We only be about 50 or 60 kilometers away from a five kilometer wall. And you'll get lots of pixels on the walls of Alice Marina, so that'll be fun. Next slide, please. Our payloads do all this. We have a remote sensing payload, a panoramic imager and a panoramic mid-infrared spectrometer mounted on the mast on the rover, which goes up to a height of about uh, 1.3 meters. The camera is really, the spectrometer is a little lower than that. We have the arm for in-situ measurements with the MOSFAR spectrometer. That detects iron mineralogy very precisely. An alpha particle X-ray spectrometer, which is a pathfinder heritage. Uh, but this time, they're really going to calibrate it, so we'll really know what the element of composition is to higher precision. A microscopic imager with a 30 micron resolution and a rock abrasion tool to dig into the rocks a little bit and look what's beneath the surface of the near of the rocks. Next slide, please. In a bit more detail, the pan cam has 15 color filters visible to the near infrared. Um, a 1024 by 1024 CCD image. The, the figure of merit that's most interesting is the essentially 0.3 mil radians per pixel resolution. That's three times better than the IMP camera on Pathfinder and it corresponds essentially to 2020 vision in a human being. So we're going to see Mars as a human being see Mars with these cameras. The thermal emission spectrometer, one of these has already been built for uh, Apex, will pretty unambiguously determine the, uh, the mineralogy around us at the landing site. That will let us pick targets of interest. Next slide, please. The way we'll do this, we'll, look, we'll do a panorama with the imager and with the thermal emission spectrometer overlaying where we find interesting spectra, we'll identify, uh, we'll also look at the colors of the rocks, we'll pick targets, we'll then drive to the rocks, next slide please, um, and deploy the instrument arm that has a turret containing the four instruments, the alpha particle X-ray spectrometer, the MOSFAR spectrometer, the rock abrasion tool, and the, uh, the microscopic imager that rotate, they're on a turret wrist, so we can deploy them successively onto a rock after the arm is deployed to the rock, next slide please. Um, 30 microns per pixel for the microscopic imager. Really what this does, this is like a geologist's hand lens. It's not, it's not a high-powered microscope, it's more of uh, a little, a little uh, hand lens that gets you a better look at rocks 
and it's good enough to pick out one of the mineral shapes and to help identify the mineralogy, especially in conjunction with the other instruments. Uh, next slide, please. The Moskauer spectrometer from um, the University of Mainz in Germany has been, uh, well, short this up. The Moskauer effect allows you to determine unambiguously what the iron minerals are in rock. And we know there's iron on Mars. This instrument is going to work. It's going to tell us a lot about the surface of Mars and the geochemistry of the surface of Mars. Uh, we can look for the things we know are there, the oxides and the silicates. Maybe we will find iron carbonates and iron sulfates on the surface as well. Um, we'll also carry magnets, uh, like we did on Pathfinder, which collect the magnetic portion of the dust on Mars. And this time around, we'll be able to analyze the mineralogy of that magnetic portion, in particular using the most far spectrometer. Next slide, please. Um, the alpha particle X-ray spectrometer is similar to the one that was flown on this, or attached to the Sojourner rover on Pathfinder. Uh, it has been redeveloped and redesigned for the Rosetta mission by the, uh, the German team that is delivering this to us. And um, they will, I promise, really calibrate it this time, in particular in Mars conditions, Mars temperatures, and in a Mars CO2 atmosphere. That was one of our problems on Pathfinder. It hadn't been calibrated in CO2. And we saw a lot of carbon, but all the carbon we were seeing was the carbon dioxide between the detector and the surface. So we couldn't tell using that instrument whether there was any carbon in the rocks, which is what you want to do. Look for first carbonate, and then uh, any organic residues that would probably be a much lower level. Next slide, please. The rock abrasion tool is a new development from Honeybee Industries in uh, Manhattan. Um, we will be able to drill into rock about half a centimeter, up to an angle of 15 degrees slope, and um, expose the, the insides of rocks. It'll be a little bit polished. There'll be a lot of dust generated. We'll pop up pieces of fairly rough polish, and we'll be able to look at that with the microscope, the moss power, and the ATXS. What the real beauty of these rovers with their instrument suites is, is the combination of the instruments, the combination of the information that lets us make operational scientific investigation, operational decisions for how to conduct a scientific investigation on the surface. We have a panorama uh, with color information. Correlated with that color information, we have the thermal infrared information, where each pixel in there corresponds to a spectrum which we can match up with a mineralogic database. Uh, searching through that, that image space, we will pick targets to approach, and then this is what a Moskauer spectrum looks like. Uh, the fit here is for hematite. That's actually the power of calibration targets that we will use to calibrate these instruments before we fly. Next slide. Please. The interpretation of the data, as I said, will involve looking at the entirety of the information we, we glean from the surface of Mars to identify specific minerals, the element of chemistry, the textures, and putting all of that into the geologic context to be able to tell the story of how the surface of Mars evolved in the places we go to and test hypotheses that we pause it ahead of time about those places before we get there. See if we're right, if we're wrong, learn new things to explore. Next slide, please. The things we're going to do as firsts with the Mars Exploration Rover will have much greater mobility than Sojourner. We will have the first remote sensing spectrometer on the surface. This spectrometer we will have on the rovers is very similar to the one that's in orbit. Um, the view from orbit, however, has a lot of dust in between. We're going to be a lot closer to our rocks. It's going to be a lot less complicated information uh, of dust in the atmosphere in between us, although there may be some on the tops of the rocks that we'll actually then have to drill through to be able to use the uh, infrared spectrometer on this, those ratted rocks. Stereo color, three times higher spatial resolution than ink took, three times higher than we had before. First look at mineralogy and texture at, uh, in rock interiors and at fine scale with this hand lens that will view the surface of, uh, the surface of Mars at ten times higher spatial resolution um, than we've ever done before. There's a little um, controversy about this, and sometimes quoted as two orders of magnitude. Um, that is perhaps related to the image, but if you compare to Sojourner's cameras, we actually did see things in Sojourner's cameras that were um, half a millimeter in size. So we're getting down to 30 microns in our case. We will ident identify unambiguously iron bearing minerals on the surface. We will have the first high quality element analysis with an APXS. We'll do ground truth mineral identification compared to the orbital remote sensing, and the first determination of the, the actual mineralogy of the dust on Mars. And with that, I'll just take questions in the what, three minutes, like four minutes?
Yes. Are you flying any micro experiments besides the magnet, like Jeff Rennes, dust collection, and field abrasion experiment? No. The way this uh, the way this mission was chosen um, by headquarters, it was said basically. Um, the Athena payload, as it was originally proposed in '98, with that science team on the road. So um, there are certain there have been certain proposals and there are certain modifications to some of the instruments that were there. Um, Russian uh, Russian team in Iraq and so on. For the proposal. But otherwise, we're sticking we're sticking to that mandate. Um, we don't have. I think the the calibration target like will be like the polar lander will be a sub configuration. So we will have a bit of a um, what Jeff Landis did, one of the solar cells will have a detector to make measurements of what the solar insulation is and how it progresses during the mission. Yes. Yeah. In the back, will that thing be able to travel? Pardon me? How far will that thing be able to travel? What the question is how far will the drone be able to travel? The capability is for a kilometer. We are required by headquarters to drive one of the rovers at least 600 meters. Um, that's the way requirements work in the space game. That is our that is our minimum bar. That's that's the bar we have to get over. Um, of course, we're going to want to go a lot further than that, probably because it's going to be something nifty sitting on the horizon right at the back. Uh, what are the limitations on any kind of extended missions? Have you considered any kind of a mini CO2 pump to blast dust off the areas you've been raiding? Um, I'd love to consider that. Like I said just before, we can't add anything to this payload. We're already very tight on mass as it is. Um, but as far as extended mission goes, we're constrained by the Mars sun distance, and more so even than the communications uh, data rates. And if without the margin, we run out of power at about a, at Sol 100. That is to say, the power levels that the sun provides are only sufficient for housekeeping. We can't actually do anything. That's without the margin. You know, we design things pretty robustly at JPL. So I'm, I'm betting we're going to go about 120 sols for the first rover, maybe 150. The second row were maybe 110 or And it wouldn't last through the winter? Um, I don't think so. We'll run into thermal control issues for that. We may wake up later, but I, that, that's pure speculation. <laughs> How much time does it take to find a rock, get down, get this device down to the surface, grind on the surface, pull the device back, get the camera in? Uh, take uh, yeah. information. Can, what, what kind of a time? The time frame for that is that entire turnaround is something like if the, if the initial traverse of the rock is not too far, um, we have about a 10% margin of error, so we'd be 10 meters off potentially at a 100 meter row. So um, we want to get, say, within three or four meters of a rock, and then that takes one sol, let's say, then we'll do a close approach to line ourselves up. Um, then we would deploy the first set of instruments, and that might take two more days. So, optimistically, four sols. Um, pessimistically, if we have trouble aligning the rover, which we will a few times given what Sojourner did, given our experience with field rover, say six. So, it's entirely our, our target of having um, half a dozen targets with each rover is entirely doable with this mission, in addition to the long distance driving, since we're capable of something like 100 meters per day in fairly even terrain. Um, I should add, one of the, thing, one of the numbers that's quoted. What a field geologist can do in 30 seconds, it takes this rover one day to do. That's, that's where we're at with, with, quote, a robot on Mars. That's the best we can do. This is the cutting edge. So what we're doing in 90 days, a geologist in the field can do in about 45 minutes. One more question. What, what instrument would you most like to fly that you're not able to fly right now? Personally, <laughs> I don't have any choice, in that, but something along the lines of um, something. Was the with, oh, excuse me. The question was, what instrument, given my brothers, would I like to fly that I, that isn't on the payload at the moment? And I think it would be something like uh, a dust removal device. That sort of at the most basic level would let us, because we're going to generate dust with the, with the with the drill. We know, and it's going to it's going to be in the field of view. Now, the experiments we've done in the lab, it looks like if we drill on surfaces that are vertical or 45 degrees, it'll be all right. We'll see the, we'll see the rock, we'll see what we're doing, and we'll be able to do good science with it. But the best answer would be to have some, I don't know, compressed air um, system that will just blow the dust away. Likewise, a cleaner, something to keep the solar panels clean. Actually, the best answer would be an RTG. So well, I, you know, I, 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 but that's a bigger rover. An RTG on 150, 170 kilogram rover. So it's, it's another scale. That's it. Okay, who's next in our week? Who's up?
The talk in this session will be given by uh, Mike Duke from Colorado School of Mines. The title is Conceptual Rover for Exploring Lunar Coal Traps and then Straight Water Traps. Okay, this uh, talk is uh, uh, conceptual but based on some work that we've been doing at the Colorado School of Mines that's aimed at uh, learning how to design a rover and uh, water extractor to fly to the lunar polar regions to extract uh, water. Uh, next slide, please. The Lunar Prospector mission has given us information that uh, uh, is consistent with there being deposits of ice near the lunar poles in, uh, in permanently shadowed craters. The sun never shines, so it's very cold. Um, and, and if that is the case, then uh, we may have an ore for rocket propellant. That's the basis of this uh, research. From, from ice, we could produce hydrogen and oxygen. If we have propellant on the moon, it makes the job of exploring the moon a lot easier uh, by, by being able to refuel a spacecraft on the moon that is returning to Earth. You can cut down the cost of uh, getting it uh, there and back to the Earth by uh, somewhere between a half, a half and 75%. And, and if there is mineable ice on the moon, we will change our way of thinking about the moon. Uh, people have not thought a lot about uh, putting a human base uh, near the poles of the moon until, until now. And, uh, and so that's a difference. And in addition, the possibility of mining ice on the moon uh, introduces an economic incentive for for exploring and, and using the moon. <clears throat> the, uh, the lunar prospector uh, detected hydrogen concentrations near the poles. We don't absolutely know that they are uh, in the, the that the hydrogen is in the form of water, but it is very consistent with all of the modeling that has been done. Uh, for uh, uh, the behavior of coal traps on the moon, that the, the, what, what happens is that any water molecule released anywhere on the moon uh, will jump out like it's on a hot griddle. Uh, it'll get hot, it'll jump. It doesn't have enough energy to leave the moon entirely, so it, it will land, it will, uh, it will jump again. Uh, uh, until it finds a cold place, and the ultimate cold place is, is the uh, uh, polar region. Uh, there's, there's some probability that ice or water molecule will be removed from the moon during these hops, uh, but that's probably on the order of uh, 50 to 60 percent, so half of the water molecules will make it to the poles. There are some other processes that would remove ice uh, molecules once deposited even in these cold traps, uh, and that is a, a, a matter of, uh, of contention. We're not really going to know until we actually go and measure the <coughs> water content uh, in these uh, craters through the poles. Uh, but the, uh, the current data are consistent with, with uh, uh, distributions of about 1% uh, water mixed with the ice, mixed, mixed with the soil in, in the uh, lunar polar craters. <clears throat> the lunar prospector data right now is low resolution. So uh, you can just get out of, out of the data set an indication that the, the hydrogen concentrations are, are associated with the bigger craters, the bigger craters that are in permanent shadow. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> the polar environments in these cold traps are dark and cold. Uh, because the moon's axis of rotation 
is essentially perpendicular to the plane of the ecliptic, that is, sunlight always comes essentially uh, uh, perpendicular to the, to the polar uh, rotation axis, so that any within within 10, 20, long, even 30 degrees of the of the uh, lunar pole, there may be craters that are permanently shaded from from the sun. <coughs> in, in a place that the sun never shines, uh, the temperatures can be as uh, low as 25 Kelvin, uh, which is the uh, which is basically a temperature that's controlled by the uh, little bit of heat that is still escaping from the moon. <coughs> but areas that where where the bottom of a crater may be permanently shadowed, but the rims of the crater may be in sunlight sometime will have some uh, reflected uh, um, reflected light that will raise the mean temperature in those, in those areas. Uh, ice probably isn't stable above about 100 Kelvin temperatures, so any place where the average, where, where, where the temperature rises above 100 K uh, <coughs> will not have any ice. There's another property of the lunar poles, though, and that is near the poles, right at the poles, um, uh, there, there are high places where where the sun may be shining all the time, or, or 70% to 75% of the time. So there may be an association of places where uh, there are there is essentially permanent sunlight and uh, uh, permanent shadow, and well, they may be within a few kilometers of one another. Um, as I said, cold traps may, may exist uh, as much as 20, 25 degrees from the pole, uh, and and this is that, this is interest, in, interesting and useful because if you don't if, if you're at the if you're at the lunar pole, you can see the Earth uh, about half of the time because the, the moon sort of moves up and down and it's it's uh, rotating in, in its movement around the around the Earth, and, and if you're at the pole of the moon, the Earth's looks like it rises and sets vertically. It goes up for a while and it goes down for a while. And half of the time, you can't see the Earth. But if you get five or 10 degrees away from the pole, you can have a site which is, uh, in which the Earth is viewable all the time. Uh, uh, but of course, from those sites, there is a day and night. You, you still are, are dark half the time. <coughs> Let me go to the next slide. But it gives you some more. Uh, gives you some more. Uh, it gives you some more opportunities. This uh, a crater that's sort of interesting is this one, which is on the lunar front side, pretty close to the center. It's about it's about uh, 78 degrees uh, south latitude which means it's 12 degrees from the pole. Uh, and whereas most of the, uh, most of the terrain around, around the lunar poles is pretty rugged, this is actually a flat floored crater. But it, at, the, at the side of the crater, which uh, uh, is, is, facing, uh, is facing north, the sun never shines. So here's a combination of a, of a shadow place where the topography is, is reasonably flat and should be uh, perhaps easier to get at with uh, equipment than uh, other more rugged places. Next slide. <coughs> Going into our study, we made a, a number of assumptions. One is that most of the lunar ice is going to be pretty close to the surface. And that's a consequence of the fact that the, the models right now suggest that the lunar ice would have been deposited relatively recently. Uh, the, the coal traps have not existed for, uh, for more than two or three billion years, which is fairly recent on, on the moon. Uh, and in that period of time, the dominant uh, activity uh, at the moon is, 
is meteorite impact, which is stirred and mixed the material, but only to a depth of uh, two or three meters. So lunar ice, ice deposited in that period of time will tend to be located pretty close to the surface. Uh, the ice is deposited on a molecule by molecule basis, and our hypothesis is that it's not going to anneal in such a way that the lunar ice is a very strong, uh, coherent uh, unit, but more likely that the, the mixture of ice and, and soil will be a granular mixture, much as it is at every rock on the moon, and that the regolith will contain about a percent of, of water. Next. Um, a, a complete propellant production process would include excavating the regolith, extracting the water uh, by heating the regolith to perhaps 300K, perhaps not that high, uh, disposing of the material that has had the water removed, uh, taking the water and electrolyzing it, then liquefying the hydrogen and oxygen uh, gases that are produced in the electrolysis and storage and delivery of those gases, of uh, those cryogenic uh, uh, products, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. We're not, <coughs> we're not going to talk about uh, these steps, the electrolysis to, <coughs> of the products, but only of the uh, excavation and extraction process. <coughs> Now we took as a challenge to this uh, project the, the design of a small system. Uh, we we uh, have, have assumed that we can we can do this with a 50 kilogram payload, which is uh, <coughs> the, a rover with an excavation device, an extraction device, uh, and also a, a small holding tank for the water. <coughs> we want this. We want this rover to be able to excavate its own weight of, uh, of lunar regolith in, in an hour, and uh, and if the regolith contains a percent of water, we will this this 50 kilogram device will extract half a kilogram of, of water an hour. It needs to to, to detect and avoid rocks. It needs to uh, discard things that are too big to handle. That needs to discard the regolith. Uh, uh, we'll put a storage tank on it that will hold 25 kilograms of water. Uh, we need it to get in and out of the uh, permanent shadow <coughs> because some of the operations, like the, the electrolysis, liquefaction, and storage, will be done in a, in a place where it's not a permanent shadow. So we need to be able to travel back and forth with that. So, so the, the rover will operate at two speeds, one where it is traversing back and forth into the shadow, and, and then when it's actually excavating, it will be moving very slowly. It will be excavating very slowly. Next slide. Now, as some of you may remember this. This is a painting uh, by, by the University of Wisconsin <coughs> uh, to describe a, a, a PD3 miner. Uh, next slide, please. Here's our poor rendition of that in a block form, which has a, a essentially continuous bucket wheel excavator, which can move from side to side, and uh, and material is deposited. Can't be seen in this view. <coughs> back into the black box that's in the center, which contains the uh, which contains the uh, extractor. <coughs> <coughs> Next slide. Uh, our current idea for a, an extraction device is, is basically a, a uh, Archimedes screw which carries uh, soil through a heated area. Next slide, please. Uh, here's, a, here's sort of an expansion of that. The idea that we're looking at here is uh, the, the soil is introduced at one end, carried through by, by the uh, screw, 
uh, it heated as as water vapor uh, is is released. It is uh, it is collected in the form of uh, it re re condensed in the form of ice on a removable plate at the top. Uh, we haven't figured out quite how to how to remove the ice from the from the plate, but uh, but we're working on that. Next slide, please. Okay, so there are a number of critical issues involved with this. One is how do you work in the coal traps for a long period of time? The, 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 the design that we're looking at would work for 50 hours or so uh, at a time in the coal trap, um, collect 25 kilograms of water and come back out to a, a place in the sunlight. Uh, so, there's some, so, so there's some requirements you want to have is few moving parts as possible. You want it to be able to operate uh, pretty autonomously. You want, you want to keep all of the uh, electronics and other uh, systems that, that could fail if they got cold warm. You need a lightweight power supply. We'll come back to this in a minute. Currently, we're thinking about a dynamic isotope power system. Uh, <clears throat> you also need to have sensors on board to tell you where the best places to mine water is. It, it is unlikely that the water distribution is completely uniform, so you probably want to have something like a neutron detector that will, will sense the local uh, amount of subsurface, uh, uh, subsurface hydrogen. Um, and you might want to have um, a, a device that would actually directly measure the water content in the, in the material that you Next. <clears throat> the, uh, the requirements for this uh, production rover are similar to the requirements for an exploration device. <clears throat> for an exploration device, you would concentrate on experiments that would, that would um, uh, be able to determine the distribution and the, and the uh, concentration uh, of, of water, of, of, of ice. So you would add some other experiments. You might have an electromagnetic uh, uh, device for, for subsurface sounding. Uh, you might add some physical properties measurements. But, but by and large, it would, uh, it would be similar to the uh, production rover. You might add a drill to the the, the science rover, but that may not be necessary. It may be possible to use the excavation device that, that we have defined for ours as, as the equivalent of the drill. Next. Uh, power is probably the biggest consideration in this uh, system as in any, any system that you want to operate in the dark for long periods of time. Uh, <clears throat> there are other uh, ways to get power to, uh, to the system. Uh, in the next talk, you're going to hear, I think, uh, uh, one possibility that we could uh, provide power to a, a coal trap rover. Uh, we have looked at the dynamic isotope truck power system, <coughs> uh, which is a nuclear device uh, 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 an up, updated RTG, if you will, which uh, could provide both the electricity for the for the movement of the rover as well as as heat for the extraction of the volatiles. Excellent. So we've been through this, and in our first cut at the problem, everything looks like it fits. Uh, we could we could design a 50 kilogram device which will. Uh, be able to mine water at about uh, half a kilogram an hour, which means that, that uh, over a year uh, you could produce uh, 4,000 kilograms of water. Not a bad return on investment in terms of mass or energy that, that you send to them. So we're continuing to work on this and uh, hopefully by next year we'll be able to give you some, some better, more uh, more specific data on a lunar ice rover. Thanks.
some of these ideas uh, at Lockheed Martin uh, this summer where they have a, a chamber uh, that can be evacuated and, and uh, lowered to ADK uh, <coughs> and we'll start seeing uh, whether some of those things will work. It's conceivable that that you have to actually isolate it, you have to put it into a, 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 a container, seal it, do a batch process. That, that I think, will get more complicated. Mike, do you have an estimate or a, a target for the mass payback ratio? Well, and what I said was four and a half days.
shine the laser down into the hole where there's radar rise. And then that way, we can get our power efficiently, lightweight, and hopefully we can turn this into something that's going to work. Um, so current PV technology. Obviously, this is an undergraduate program that we were working on. We had a very small budget and figure out what was available to start doing some ministry testing with. Um, if you're familiar with PV technology, you know that there's single junction silicon cells, which were the first cells that everybody tended to use. Now everybody's going towards your gallium arsenide cells. If you want to make those multiple junction, you're going to add on the gallium and the phosphite and the germanium layers and start adding up the layers of your solar cells. When manufacturers make solar cells, they have to find ways of telling you how good their solar cells are or else you're not going to buy them. So this is the way that we started looking at things. And quantum efficiency is one of the measurements, and spectral response is the other one that they go and they brag about their efficiencies and how well their cells respond. We're going to be looking at a couple of those. They also use short circuit current and open circuit voltage, um, which describe kind of the quality of the power that you're getting out. When you use a battery, it's rated entirely different than a solar cell because a battery puts out a certain amount of power for a certain amount of time and then goes away. But photovoltaics put out a current amount of power and voltage at the same time. And it's in some form of current or voltage. It's not just essentially power. So that's something else to consider when you're looking at the future. Okay, so when you design a solar cell, this black line here is the flux emitted from our sun. It goes over this range here, it's got a peak out here, and it goes off. So when you look at the uh, gallium arsenide, which is a single junction that was the first solar cell used, this is the response that it picks up from the sun. Now obviously this makes sense because this is the highest emittance from the sun, and you want to match that with the cell that you're using. When you start using multiple layers, you add on out here with these other materials, the gallium and the phosphite and the germanium, and you start covering this whole range that the sun's providing us. So that is kind of like to let you know what we're working with on the wavelengths there. So what we did is our initial cell selection. We were learning about little tapes and lasers you know, from the get-go on this. One year from now, you know, prior to now, I knew nothing at all about this topic. So I'm a beginner here, and we had to do our research. So we were looking at you know, just different manufacturers, and we went to Spectral Lab, and they were they had a cell and solar cells, dual junctions, gallium arsenide, gallium and phosphate. They had an efficiency of 17.75 percent in the sun, and so because we don't know so much about it, we wouldn't have any those. Uh, we looked around in the industry and some government groups around our local area, and we borrowed two lasers that we were going to test with, well, two types of lasers: the 632 and 720 nanometer wavelengths. 632 is this right here. It's a red, helium, neon, everybody's seen it, you use it all the time. 720 is just a higher wavelength and a different type of wavelength. So this is our first results we got here. We tested with multiple cells. These are the results from cell C. We tested on three lasers that were helium, neon, like the one I'm holding here. This is actually the one I'm holding here. It's a five milliwatt. It's designed for safety pointing in situations like this. Then we also found a 10, milliwatt and 30 milliwatt lasers that were all the same type. This one was actually a very old laser, um, 12 or 13 years old, so it was getting off in age. And you can see the power efficiencies that we got were ranging from 12 up to almost 19% efficient. So, you know, this was kind of reasonable. We said, okay, this is good. Let's start to see what we're looking at. And then the, also the 720 nanometer wavelength laser that we were working with was a much higher power. And then all of a sudden, we saw this huge drop in efficiency. We're getting something out, but we're like, what happened here? We needed to understand this better and actually see what was going on. So here's just uh, the data results from three different cells that we tested with these lasers. And as you can see, these are the same trends. Each cell had about the same response, and they all dropped off at that 720 nanometer wavelength. Now, this is what's really going on. When we go back to that first chart that we saw the different wavelength, the different materials, and how they responded, this is a zoom in of the gallium arsenide and the gallium, or the gallium phosphate and the gallium arsenide materials. When you put these two materials together, you have to respond, you have to pick up a response on yourself from both materials. So this right here is the 632 wavelength lasers that we used. As you can see, it responds right here to the one material and a little bit less than the other material. So you're getting a reaction of both materials. 
when you go out to your 720 nanometer laser, you're getting a wonderful response from the gallium arsenide, but almost no response at all from the gallium indiophosphate. So this is just to help you better understand what's going on inside of the multi-junction cell. There's an anti-reflector coating, a contact so that you can get your current out. Um, you have one layer on top, a tunnel junction in between, and another layer in between here with another tunnel junction. This is just another substrate that helps the system work. Um, these tunnel junctions are kind of important because every photovoltaic produced will actually work better in cooler conditions. And you can take this to almost any range. However, with your multiple junction cells, they actually have a little temperature with a cold range limit because these tunnel junctions will freeze out. So this is something we have to look at in our application on the moon. Um, the trick to this is that when your photon comes on in the sun, if it meets the, electro the energy required to activate that level, then it'll activate an electron and it'll create an energy. What we have here is with the gallium indium phosphide, at 186 electron volts is required for your photon to activate. 172 is the electron volts that we had coming out of the 720 nanometer laser that we were using. So what was happening is it was coming through here. This layer was transparent to the photons that were activating it, and essentially going straight through to the gallium arsenide. This layer ends up acting like a dampener or a resistor, and it takes all of the power out of your circuit. So that's why we're having problems. So what we need to do is we need to switch to our single junction gallium arsenide cells. We need to match the material band gap of the laser that we're using with the material that we're going to choose. Um, so this is going to allow us to actually have a nice comparison between the dual junctions that we linked already and the single junctions that we're going to test now. We also found two more people in uh, our local area that were willing to let us borrow their lasers. So now we have two more uh, ranges to test at. We have the 830 and the 1064. So this is, we're going to try and predict what we're going to see on these tests. We purchased some single junction gallium arsenide cells. So we're looking just at this green line here. This is the 632 wavelength that I'm holding in my hand, the 720 that we tested with before, the 830 that we acquired, and a 1064. So clearly the 632 is going to respond, but it's not going to be as efficient as these other two. The 720 and the 830, we should expect some wonderful results. And it's at 1064, we're going to drop down here on the green line and have no results at all. So this is what we're going to expect. Here's our results. Again, we showed the results from our best cell, which was cell B. Um, here's the helium neon, the 720, the 830, and the 1064. And if you look at our efficiencies that we got here, they were amazing. We we're totally floored by these results. We got 68.5% efficiency with our 830 nanometer wavelength lasers. This is more than anybody expected. We had people, you know, guessing before we started this project that we could maybe you know, double your standard efficiencies, maybe 40% or so. Um, but this is great. And so it's just wonderful. And it matched exactly what we expected from our quantum efficiency graphs. Down here at the 1064, which was off the range, we saw no response at all. We also had one silicon cell that was provided to us, which has, I don't have a quantum efficiency graph here for it, but it has a wider range across the spectrum, but it never reaches quite as high. So we went ahead and we tested with the silicon cell at the 1064 wavelength, and it did have some kind of a response, but not obviously as nice as the other materials. And here I'm just going to demonstrate again how the different cells responded to the lasers. They all pretty much matched each other. We're not sure exactly what was wrong with the cell D. Perhaps you know the leads weren't attached as well, so we weren't just getting the same response out. We're not sure if it was just manufacturing the cell or not. Uh, this is obviously where we have these wonderful results at the 700 or the 830 nanometer wavelength. Um, so right now we're kind of moving into, this is the initial testing that we had, and it's wonderful. We're like, okay, we've got to do something with this. If I could do anything in the world right now, I would love to go and make single junction geranium cell. If you remember the graph that we saw in the back, in the, in the beginning, in the gallium arsenide, gallium and phosphite, and there was that huge range out there for the geranium cell. Well, the reason that you don't have germanium cells manufactured right now is that there's no response in the solar spectrum for that material. So, no, you know, the manufacturers just had to worry about it. But if you could make it efficiently, you know, the responses, the efficiencies can just skyrocket because of the response of that material. That so that's something that I would like to see happen. Um, 
you know, how feasible that is, I'm not sure. I haven't talked to any PV manufacturers about how easy it would be to make that material into a single junction. But since they're already using it in a multi junction, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. Oh, I'm going to go this um, Silicon is also another thing because when you start looking at lasers, this one is very easy to manufacture. I bought this for $5. I've had 12 of these this year. <laughs> um, and it's at that very low 632 wavelength, like, you know, thing. So it's very, you know, easy to manufacture this, but only at very small powers. When you get up and you want a higher power laser, you're probably going to need to use a much higher wavelength also. So silicon is one of the things that we might want to look at, as well as germanium, for materials at the higher wavelengths, because there are materials that respond to those wavelengths. Um, gallium arsenide, though, of course, is the one that we've seen the results for. We know that's there. We don't have to wonder, well, maybe this is theoretically it can happen. We don't know. Um, but it's something that we want to, you know, <coughs> we go with right now and know it's going to work. Okay, so these are the design traits we wanted to do just a very conceptual design trait for this actual application. And the issues that we want to look at is we have to maximize the overall efficiency of the system because everybody knows that's the bottom line, and how much power, how much mass, how much, you know, dollars is this going to cost to do. Um, we have to match the band gap of the cells with the lasers that we're going to use. This is essential. We're going to have to minimize the amount of power required by the lasers. This is an important factor in the overall system. We have to actually power these lasers on our base stations. So this is something we have to worry about, the efficiency of those lasers and how, you know, minimizing the amount of power that they need to be out. Um, we also need to prevent the heating of the solar cells. When photovoltaics are put in the sun, their efficiency goes you know, down. They heat up and they don't like it. Well, this is good and bad because, you know, first of all, we want to we can get more power out the more power we put onto them. But at the same point, we want to keep them, we're going to be in a very cold condition anyway. We're going to be in these dark craters of the moon. And so this shouldn't be too much of a problem. We know that they can handle up to 50 cents of illumination without damaging the sun because that's where they're tested at with the manufacturers. So that should be a problem for us. We also did some thermal testing, which I haven't put up here um, just to, because we had it available one day. But, you know, the manufacturers always put out the effects of thermal testing, but there will have to be some other additional testing done at colder temperatures because they usually don't go as cold as we're expecting these conditions to be on the craters. Um, so we're going to look at the Mars environment just because it's our worst case scenario. On the moon, you're not going to have any dust, you're not going to have, you know, these other problems that we know exist on Mars. <laughs> anyway, so we went ahead and we designed this for Mars because we know it's going to be our worst case condition. And we started off, we know that Mars is more deficient um, from previous missions. Um, Pathfinder, you know, chose the gallium arsenide cells because of this fact. Um, it's you know, shifted out of the blue range. The dust in the atmosphere is what causes this blue deficient um, case. So we know we're going to be in very cold temperatures. This is the lowest recorded temperature um, for Mars, and it's going to be much colder on the moon. Um, the average dust deposits in cell you know, will, that will be obscured. When Pathfinder was, when Sojourner went on its little journey, for the first 30 days, I believe, like, Six to ten percent of the surface was just entirely covered with dust, and that eventually was, you know, the end of life for Sojourner. And I mean, this is something that we're all going to have to battle with every time we're going to build any rover or solar cells. So this is something we're going to really have to look at. Um, beneficially for this system, I'll discuss that when we get to here. But um, so what we just assume from all of this is just a really big estimation that we're going to lose fifty percent of the power due to transmission above whatever efficiencies have in the actual system itself, we're just going to assume that the environment's going to cause a 50% reduction. So that's a huge safety margin. Yeah. So this right here is just a little ghetto schematic here. Uh, this is the sunlight room of the crater and here's your solar array panel which you know is going to power your lasers. And then these are going to shine down into the shade of the region here where your rover is working or doing whatever task. Now obviously you have designing your rover, this is just a picture that we have taken from other sources. Um, but the key to the thing to note here is that this receiving dish, besides the fact that it can be very, very small, 
is at an angle. So when the dust comes and hits it, it's easier for that dust to kind of fall off. And it's not going to stick as easy. So that's something that we're very excited about. Um, we also started, you know, thinking about well, what are we going to do about, you know, lasers are notorious for being very inefficient for the amount of power you're putting in here to get the power out here in the lasers. One thing that we thought of doing to minimize this was using the multiple lasers that you see here. We have four. The reason for this is it's going to be easier to produce like four lasers, and they'll be more efficient individually than if you were to have one laser that's four times as powerful. So this is a concept that we've thrown around and kind of decided to work with. So this is our design assumptions. We said we're going to take right now 68% power efficiency. Um, we're also working with the 50% loss that we decided due to dust in the atmosphere. Um, we're going to have negligible laser beams, so that you know, like loss due to the angle of the laser hitting the cells. Um, this is due to the fact that we know we're going to be able to probably articulate the receiving station, and the lasers will also have to be pointed at it. So that will be pretty minimal. We've also noticed during our testing. You know, just with ourselves, but you can really come off to you know a pretty good angle. It doesn't matter how straight you hit it, and you're going to be just fine. It's going to be received. And we also assume that we're going to use multiple lasers at lower levels as opposed to one laser at a much higher level. So this is what we came up with. Um, we just had four lasers, and we put those power those lasers to 22 and a half watts each. I don't know if you guys have listened to you know some of the you know the more realistic. Rovers. I think you just said 70 watts on yours. Um, okay, anyway, I'm not sure. Okay. But we just assume this is pretty low. Sojourner itself was receiving 15 watts um, at noon when it was operating. And so what we said is that we want our rover to um, to receive uh, 30 watts. So this is going to be seven and a half watts for each of the four lasers. Well, yeah, seven watts, seven and a half watt output for each of the lasers. It's getting 11 and a quarter after the 50% loss, and then after the 68% loss, we're going to get the 7 and a half watts into our system. Um, and this can, of course, be scaled to how much power you think your rover is going to need. We just doubled what we got from Saturn, thinking that that would be a reasonable estimate. Um, this leads to a 40, a 400 centimeter square area that you need to receive these cells on. This is this large. It's 20 by 20 centimeters. So you've already cut down on you know, the amount of solar cells that you need, your storage area. I mean, it's amazing. What we did with that is we just said, we're going to assume that the beam might expand to 10 centimeters, and we don't want to have the beams hitting on top of each other. The other thing we've noticed about that is that when you calculate the actual illumination intensity that the beams are hitting the cells on, it's only 1.06 cents, which means there's going to be almost no heating of the cells um, to you know, increase your or decrease your efficiency. So this was good. We didn't want to have to worry about it heating the cells up. Okay, so what I have right here is my little demo car. And this may seem kind of ghetto, which I think it probably is, but um, it's just a little car that we got from Radio Shack. It nominally operates on two AA batteries, um, which provide three volts and you know, about 190 milliamps of power. Um, so that's just what the two AA batteries that everybody has used before provide this car. So we started going, okay, so let's try and get the car with some hand on laser so we can take a demo because we took this you know, to some school events and some other competitions. And so we wanted to have something that we could show people that this is actually really working here. Uh, uh, what we found out very quickly was that even with four gallon arsenide cells you can multiply the you know, multiple cells to get up to three volts, we can only produce three milliamps from twelve of these handheld lasers as well. That makes sense because these are only putting out five milliamps of power anyway. So we couldn't really expect them to be to do that. We could bring in higher lasers, you know, higher power lasers and have that happen, but we wouldn't be able to demo them and have kids handle it, play with it, and have a good time. So what we designed was pretty much a little switch system. It's a little circuit that you put inside the car here. And so when I activate it, it actually just turns on a little circuit here. And so you can Closes the circuit, lets the batteries power the car. So we're just like, oh, it doesn't power it. Well, no, look at this. <laughs> you know, so you guys can come up and play with this later on. But it's just kind of a fun little thing. Um, we like it a lot. It's been pretty happy. Um, and this is only you know, providing just minimal amount to close the um, So some final words. Um, this is efficient. I think this can be done. Um, 
it really, you know, it's there. And it's solving some problems that we've discussed already in the paper. Um, these tests were all done with borrowed old lasers that were sitting in people's labs for other purposes. You know, we ordered some cells off the web, and we got them in the mail, we put them up. We put the beads up here ourselves, you know, with just a little bit of solder. You know, any other kind of system you're going to do is going to increase the efficiency that we saw here. Um, we know that we have to focus on wavelength matching. We think if we can match better the wavelength that we've used here, um, you're going to see it increase even more. We'd like to go to like 860 nanometers right up to the edge of single dimension gallium arsenide. Um, it's going to increase the efficiency even more. Um, the applications here have just grown since I started this project. You know, initially we're like, we're going to do this on the moon. There's like some great little you know, craters there, and there's going to be ice and stuff. And we're like, okay, cool. So then we went to this competition, and there were some other teams that had like little mini rovers that would break off into like the mother rover and whatnot. So this is great. You, you know, you power your lasers on the mother rover, and you shoot a beam out, and your little baby rover can go around and doing stuff. You know, it can work on things. Somebody mentioned, you know, on the shuttle, you can be out doing experiments and have like, some kind of like, I've seen these little red balls that they've got on the space station. You know, maybe it needs some more power, so you just got it out floating on its own and you just beam some power over to it, you know. The things that we can apply this to, to me, are really exciting, even more so than just this. And so, I just, it makes me really cool to see, like, everybody keeps mentioning new ways that we can use this. I'm really excited about it. Um, so you can use it in <coughs> areas. It's benign. If you want to use, you know, some kind of radioactive power source, that's great. You're going to get heavy. You might be you know, disturbing the environment that you're taking measurements of. Maybe you've got some system that's going on, and if you bring in this huge power source, you might be disturbing it. But you know, one sun of illumination is the most benign thing you can put into the system. Um, it's lightweight. You know, it can increase your range. You can use this for distances of up to like one to ten kilometers. It doesn't matter how far you be you're going to have minimal losses when you increase your ranges. So, that's about all I have. Or is that why, you know, how's what's the connection with your new job? I don't think we're going to know that I'm doing this. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> <laughs> which, I mean, currently, I guess you could say that this is the property of the University of Colorado because they did fund it. Um, but as far as rights and idea rights, I am such a beginner to this, I have no idea, like, what the legal, you know, yada yada is. I, I, they don't know. <laughs> what will it take to increase the, the range of the laser? Yeah, he, he said it was like a couple kilometers or so. <coughs> Microwave. So I guess from the crater. How how far? What's the range? How, how far can you beam from um, a laser to a rover? Or is it as far as a laser to rover application, I think you've already hit the maximum that you would want to have anyway. I mean, when you, you start looking at surfaces and terrains, if you want to beam more than ten kilometers, you know, you've got mountains in the way anyway. You've got to range. Yeah. Exactly. Your pointing issues become a limitation and you get some other issues. But you can theoretically increase it pretty substantially up to you know, 50 kilometers. Okay. Uh, have you looked at all about the possibility of using uh, uh, 532 nanometers for double gag? Uh, you can get uh, between 30 and 50 percent conversion efficiency from the fundamental to the second harmonic on YAG. And uh, the, the 532 in the green, uh, there may be some cells there that might not run, uh, 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 that might not be too bad. And the photon energy is higher in, in the green. Exactly. And, uh, so you know, that may not be bad. Uh, five, uh, uh, 632. Uh, uh, Heenies are known to be disastrously inefficient uh, yeah. at, at, at the transmitter end. 
so uh, heenies are bad categorically. Uh, it's going to take an awful lot of solar cells to power up a, a good sized heeny. But uh, um, uh, MDAG uh, is much more efficient, uh, and even if you double it, it's still uh, more efficient than uh, heeny. Exactly. I would agree with you entirely. And it's just something uh, there may be some two six uh, compound semiconductors, uh, the uh, uh, zinc, uh, cadmium, selenide uh, family, uh, sulfide selenide family that might work in the green fairly well. I think that's all perfect for further reach research. We just didn't have you know, the time and the resources, and I think that is the definite possibility that we'd like to go into. Did you do anything with uh, the tracking system? on that to see what kind of feet, because it's easy for the rubber to track the laser, it's much harder for the source to actually track where the rubber is. Did you right. pilot beam or anything like that, or did you think about that? We didn't look into it too much, but we figured it wouldn't be that hard to implement you know, like some kind of a feedback loop between the two of them. It's not something we focus on. What do you estimate the overall system we must be like, including solar cells, lasers, all the pieces. We haven't gotten into it too much. I kind of envision it as, you know, just maybe a whole unit that can land and then the rover can start working its way down to where it wants to or else, you know, maybe possibly two landers that could go in. We had some really interesting presentations at the Heads Up competition that we went to. Um, some individuals who are not actually in the undergraduate competition, but we were just presenting there had some wonderful ideas about um, full will take manufacturing on the moon where you can actually use part of the moon's surface itself to have this swimmable contraction that goes along with these um, solar cells. So it could obviously be implemented as part of that system where it could take advantage of that power source and just create those full takes on the moon. When you have an auxiliary uh, battery on there, so if you want the rover to go behind a rock or something, so you wouldn't have that straight line distance. Yeah, that's an assumption we would increase. We would definitely, you know, assume that there's some kind of backup battery system where if you're in direct line of sight, you're going to work, you know, directly that way and conserve your power. And then if you're like, oh, there's a big rock I want to go around, you know, and it'll be intelligent enough to say, I have this much power in my reserve batteries right now. I'm going to need this much power to get from here to the other side of the rock. I can make it. And if it doesn't decide that it can make it back into line of sight, it won't take that path. It'll go somewhere else. And that, that's what we'd like to see happen. Eventually, we'll need higher power uh, requirements uh, and just for a simple rover more in, in terms of, uh, say, uh, ambient mining. Have you looked into uh, matching up probably what's most common laser CO2? Right. CO2 is all the way out at 10 nanometers, and we actually, 10 microns, I mean, um, it's something that you definitely have to do some more little tank material research. I don't know of anything that would respond at that way. We actually use that for some of our thermal testing because we can heat up the cell without even damaging it. Um, so if that's something I would like to look into, yes, because that's where we tested with you know, a 12 watt laser um, for our heating conditions. Um, but I don't know if materials that respond and produce current at that range. I mean, you, you mentioned that there, there's no photovoltaic uh, manufactured single junction uh, germanium. But, I mean, there are single-junction germanium photovoltaics out there. They just call them detectors. Okay. Detector community. Mercat Tell. A mercury cap and telluride uh, will yeah, be able to detect well, CO2. Well, for CO2, but yeah. I was talking, you know, I mean, even people build single-junction germanium yeah. detectors with and, short and, IR. And dope germanium, uh, since they're talking minus 112 degrees, the cooled germanium always works better for detectors than cooled. Okay, more, but, but yeah, the, the question I was getting for was uh, um, your photovoltaics on your base station, what size are those? You gave us this size for your receiver on your... Right, TV exactly. Or those or are going to have <laughs> very, very large arrays. And that's something that we didn't focus on, but it's something that we're assuming will be a very large array. And will probably be you know, triple dual junction because they will be in solar. You know, So they'll be your standard solar cells. Mm -hmm. Um, and not what I'm going to call full takes, which is what we're using for the same thing. But um, yeah, that's going to be a substantial array size. Any more? Thank you.
move on to the last presentation of this morning. Um, a presentation by Henry Furman, uh, the Mars Scarab Explorer Architecture. Um, I guess the co-authors are all at the Earth Sciences Corporation in Virginia. And we're going to give one last try for the electronic presentation, and then after that, we're going to go Good morning, my name is Henry Berman. I work in the Mission Programs Group at Orbital Sciences Corporation. Here on behalf of my colleagues, Bob Kine and James Price, uh, we'd like to uh, present to you kind of a vision a little bit further in the future, more, more so than current uh, Mars missions that are going on. Uh, something to address the goals of the Mars scientific community for exploring Mars uh, in depth. Uh, there's kind of a conspiracy theory to this whole presentation that I think you'll pick up on that we really like to have humans on Mars. It's kind of our long-term goal. I'm sure a lot of people here that want to be uh, My son, who's 10 years old, wants to be one of the first people on Mars, so I have a directive to try to get that whole thing here. So uh, what we did is we looked at top-down kind of requirements of what would be required to address all of the scientific goals that the Mars community has set out. Uh, what we want to do, the goals are to Hasten the comprehensive exploration of Mars. We want to speed this whole process up. Uh, but the, the reason behind that is, of course, we want to find that golden egg, which is either going to be the liquid water or the, or the science of life that is going to justify sending humans to Mars to do detailed exploration. It's either going to be a space race with the Chinese or some kind of cataclysmic event that's going to require transplanting the whole human race to Mars to get, to get us there. Uh, or something of, of significant science, uh, such as life or liquid water. Uh, so our goals are to provide continuous surface and airborne presence on Mars, uh, continuous versus the intermittent kind of presence that, that we've had in the past. Uh, this would be something similar to the Hubble Space Telescope that has a long manifest of science that it's crunching through. The whole scientific community has input into it and it kind of works through it. We can set up an architecture on Mars that would allow continuous team of scientists to work, this would really get us closer to uh, making big, the, the big discoveries. So this system should allow aerial imaging as well as detailed surface evaluation simultaneously. And it should be autonomous and self-sufficient in uh, operations. Uh, again, we want to facilitate the discoveries and establish the uh, database infrastructure necessary for human missions to Mars. So what we did is we started with the goals when I had about four of them that I had through, that were presented this morning, uh, uh, basically the, the Mars science goals are to find the Martians, uh, determine the climate on Mars, uh, look at the geology of Mars, and prepare for human exploration. And the cross cutting thread of that that was mentioned this morning is water. It's uh, follow the water to find the life. Uh, the climate should help us determine what happens to the liquid water. Uh, looking at the morphology of the surface of Mars, we can have clues as to where the water might be hiding. And then, of course, for human exploration, you're going to need water for oxygen, uh, propellant generation, and, of course, water. So water is the underlying theme of all, all of Mars exploration, and, and that's really what we're looking for. It's kind of a, a needle in the haystack right now, and uh, we, we want to set up an architecture that can, that can address that. So what we did is we went to this, this document, Scientific Goals. Uh, the dozens of Mars scientists got together and determined what the long-term goals are for, for exploring Mars. Uh, edited by Ryan Greeley and uh, released in March 2001. It's the latest one. We went through that for a couple of days uh, just try to figure out what the essence is of what they're looking for. Not specific missions, but how are, they gonna, how are we going to enable these scientists to do the exploration that they need to do. It's very aggressive. Uh, exploration plan, and, and we've broken it down into three key areas. They're looking for a lot of mobility, endurance, and the ability to have kind of a wide field view and also get down and touch the surface. They want to have that kind of capability. And I've kind of just pulled out some quotes just to, as evidence of, uh, to back this up. It's looking for 20 stations at four targeted sites to conduct in situ measurements. Uh, for sample return, they don't want to just have a return from one single site. They want to have diverse sites, uh, even beyond, say, the, the capability of the current rovers. So we're either talking three missions to do that, or we're talking some, some mobility 
to bring samples from different regions of Mars to the Mars incentive. Uh, so again and again, they, throughout this document, we talk about that first sites, uh, many locations, they want to have a lot of data. And the past, present Mars missions really have only offered a single site ground evaluation uh, with, within the range of rovers, which even now is going to be limited to about one kilometer. Or orbital platforms, which of course can map the whole, whole surface of Mars, but can't get down in the dirt, which is what you need to do. Uh, so the lander rover approach is it's going to take hundreds of missions to address the Mars goals. And my son said that that is clearly not acceptable for getting into Mars. So, um, so that, that's the main thing, mobility uh, over many kilometers in a single mission uh, is, is being called for. Second thing, in addition to mobility, is endurance. We're asking for missions with uh, you know, no less than one year mission life. Some of these, they want 10 years in situ monitoring. Uh, they want a lot of data over a lot of time. They're going to need this data before they send humans to Mars. They're going to need to know what the environment is, is for, for the design of the habitation stations. So this is going to require significant power, autonomy, and uh, redundancy, and uh, well beyond what we're currently looking at. So in addition to mobility, we're talking endurance over years, not weeks or months. And then mobility, endurance, and the ability to do remote sensing and in situ exploration, essentially simultaneously. They talk about being able to sense or evaluate hundreds of sites. Maybe basically taking a, a global view at these sites, and then picking out a few of the sites and saying, hey, those are the ones, uh, based on some evidence that we think we need to go down and start digging in the dirt or touching and evaluating. Um, and, and we, we want to be able to do that and have the scientists have the ability to do that in a matter of weeks, not two years for another mission to come down to that site and land. Uh, I, I kind of, it's kind of akin to uh, an Easter egg hunt. The egg is, is the water of the life that we want to find there. And what, what children do on the Easter egg hunt is they scan the field first, they take a global look at the, at the field, see if there's any easy eggs to find that are leaning up against the tree. Uh, then they look in an area or a corner and start to look for clues where the egg might be tied. Maybe there's a, a flower pot that's turned upside down. It's, it's obvious that something might be under there. Now they need to go down and, and in situ, need to evaluate the surface and pick it up and look and see if the egg is under that. This is a basic, basic exploration process. If we need to do these, if we're going to be doing these steps each with each mission, this is going to this is going to take far far too long to get to find the golden egg. So we need to be able to have this capability to take a broad view and say that looks interesting. Within a matter of hours, get down there and take a look at it. So in addition to mobility and uh, endurance, we're talking remote sensing in situ. Now what I'm kind of building up here is I haven't talked any about our architecture. I'm just saying that. This is the approach that we, that we uh, took to look at how to address the scientific needs. We all have pet projects, I like Mars airplanes, other people like uh, Mars rovers, but we wanted to take kind of strip away our prejudices and take a broad view and say, how can we get this job done? Just to back up uh, my search, and this is uh, some of the Mars missions, log log scale of duration versus surface area to cover. Of course, orbiters and flybys to cover a large area that you can't get down into the dirt once you've evaluated it. Uh, the landers uh, are down in the dirt, but they're very, very limited. And even the rovers are, are limited. limited. And what, uh, what we really want to do is operate here, where we're going to have a mobility uh, to really make those discoveries. So far, we haven't had this kind of uh, mobility. I mean, we've, we've been doing a step-by-step -step approach to evaluating Mars. If we really want things to happen fast, we need to have, uh, we need to stop looking macro and micro scale and get down to the way people explore, which is take a look and get down and, and, and look at the interesting areas. So what we've come up with this whole kind of requirements, uh, looking at what the scientific community needs is what we call this, the SCAR Explorer Architecture. It's uh, SCAR stands for self-contained, autonomous, reconfigurable, airborne bus. Self-contained is for the endurance, the autonomous is it, it needs to it needs to have control and autonomy and safe modes, uh, but it also needs to have the, the ability to be re redirected by the science community. Uh, it's reconfigurable in that itself it doesn't perform any science. It's, sim it's simply providing the architecture for the science payloads and experiments. Uh, it's airborne so that we can get that far afield and also get down to the ground and, and put the 
payload in contact with the ground. And plus, in, in two, two definitions, one is spacecraft plus is kind of a platform that's generic that you drop, you drop uh, your instruments in to do your specific mission, but also a bus for moving things around, just, just like a, a regular bus. Uh, it's broken up into three components. This uh, mobile neutrally buoyant explorer, which is essentially a, a blimp or a dirigible, which is filled with hydrogen, and uh, an in situ propellant production unit, which uh, uses the ice from the uh, polar, uh, polar regions of Mars, uh, breaks the ice into hydrogen and oxygen for, for use in the neutrally buoyant explorer as well as uh, fuel cell use. So the in situ hydrogen oxygen production is the backbone for, for the energy of the system. The mobile neutrally buoyant airborne platform is what provides us the far field, near field, field of view and mobility. Uh, the solar fuel cell power cycle, which I'll explain in a bit, is, is where we get the ultimate endurance. And this, is, this provides true Mars exploration uh, because it, it really is a, it really provides the scientists with a lot more ability than single missions that we've currently been doing. And the platform, of course, is not mission specific. So the first element is this in-situ propellant production unit. Uh, this is just kind of a sketch of what this thing might look, look like. It would land, say, with an uninflated uh, Scarab Airborne Explorer. It would inflate its wheels and go to a suitable location on the, on the polar ice cap to begin harvesting uh, some of the ice. Uh, harvest the ice, melt the ice, uh, break it into hydrogen and oxygen. Use the hydrogen to inflate the uh, envelope of the, of the balloon. Uh, essentially dump the oxygen until the uh, explorer is at a neutrally buoyant point. Then it would uh, store an excess amount of hydrogen and oxygen which is used for the fuel cell operation. Once the airborne explorer has gone off and started to do its mission, it can continue operating by unfurling its, its own solar arrays and continue propellant production in anticipation of a replenishment from the original explorer or additional uh, airborne explorers that arrive. So that provides the backbone for the power that will give us a, a longer duration of uh, missions. The Airborne Explorer itself is a high pressure inflatable lifting surface vehicle. It's essentially a blimp, but it's shaped a lot flatter and has an air cool shape as well. The flatness al allows us to cover the upper surface with flexible solar arrays. This is uh, also key to the uh, power infrastructure. Uh, the air cool shape also allows us to modulate uh, altitude with a, with a small angle attack variation. It gives, it gives us a little bit more control. There's a power guidance and propulsion pod or not on, on the lower surface. And we're talking right now about a 90 kilogram payload capability with reasonable uh, technology readiness levels for most of the technologies. Uh, the first thing people usually say when I, when I say this is Mars Blimp is, hey, there's, don't you know it's really windy on Mars and this thing's going to get blown all over the place and smacked up against the canyon wall and torn up? It's true there, there are high winds that uh, a lot of the times the winds uh, are, can get as high as uh, 100 feet per second or so. Um, but you have to remember that we're talking about one half of 1% of the air density on Earth. So what you think of as a 100 mile an hour wind on Earth, tearing off roofs and things like that, it, on Mars it's equivalent to about a 5 mile an hour wind in terms of the force you feel and the dynamic pressure resulting from that. There just aren't that many particles, though they're moving that fast, there, there aren't enough particles to slam into you to reproduce the same kind of force you feel on Earth. So that's the good news. The bad news is there's not a lot of air density to float in, so you need a lot larger hydrogen volume to uh, be neutral buoyant. Also, both Viking and Pathfinder data have, sh have shown, at least in those areas, that there was a 360 degree rotation of the direction of wind. Uh, so we can actually use that to our benefit. This, this Airborne Explorer may only be mobile two or three hours out of a day. It would be tethered, anchored, or grappled to some area where experiments are being performed. And once it uh, sees a favorable wind direction in the direction it really wants to go, releases the tether, or pulls up the anchor, and it moves in that direction until it gets to the point where it wants to be, and then it uh, fires a tether and drops an anchor to, uh, to, be, to, to maintain the station at the, next, at the next location. So we can use the wind to our advantage. The gondola contains the fuel cell flight control system. It's got two reversible ductile electric fan engines that can pitch. They're seldom used, only used when you're, when you're moving around 
uh, untethered for when you need fine-tuned control. They, they require a lot of power, so they're, they're really only for fine-tuned control. There's uh, extending gravel anchors that uh, can uh, allow the vehicle to get down to the surface and, and stay at the surface. Uh, there's also an interface with uh, what would be science payloads to provide power or act as a communication relay for science payload or actually to go up to an existing rover, uh, charge it up using its, its solar array, pick it up and move it to a new location so it can go on another 30 or 40 day mission in, in a new location. The technology we're talking about, we can do an existing launch vehicle. We don't need a new development launch vehicle to do this. We can fit with an existing uh, uh, medium launch vehicle payload shroud and, and, uh, and launch capability. And the, uh, what, what we can launch is actually a single IPPU and a an uninflated explorer, or three uninflated explorers that were brought in with, uh, with a propellant production unit that's already on Mars. So again, most of the technologies are doable. Uh, even with today's technologies, we could do something like this, and however, <coughs> <clears throat> performance would be severely degraded, so we are going to try to ensure, especially the solar array technologies, for the flexible solar array. Control is similar to dirigibles. There's internal bladders or balloonettes which you which you pump and shift the center of buoyancy. This allows you to pitch or roll depending on how you shifted the, the hydrogen slug within the envelope. Uh, this also allows us to maintain pressure in the envelope to maintain the shape. Uh, and also uh, allows us to modulate altitude by changing the volume, the displaced volume of uh, Martian air. So altitude modulation is a combination of buoyancy volume, buoyancy augmentation by increasing that volume, or also lift, because even though the lift to drag ratio of this configuration is, is not very good, if you have a reasonable forward velocity or a headwind, if you're at flying at an angle of attack, you can actually get an altitude that's higher than your neutral buoyancy point and get down to an altitude lower than your neutral buoyancy point. And the engines augment, augment that capability. The power cycle, there's a couple slides here. Start, start with, of course, the polar ice, melt that into water. The photovoltaic power is used to crack the water into, into hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen is used to inflate the envelope. The oxygen is dumped. Uh, once the explorer is fully inflated, it stores some hydrogen and oxygen so that at nighttime or peak power requirements, you run this back through the fuel cell and you get power back out and water out the half the end as well. The water can be used as ballast, uh, but once you start dumping water, uh, you're dumping your fuel basically because this cycle continues. You use excess, photo, excess solar power during the day to crack the water back down to hydrogen and oxygen. At the nighttime, you reverse that process. Um, the hydrogen itself is, serves as a buoyancy reserve, but again, if you start venting hydrogen and using up your, your hydrogen, you're using your fuel capability. So during the day, 50% of the photovoltaic power is used to, to just operate the system. The other half is used to continually break the water back down into hydrogen and oxygen. That cycle can continue on indefinitely as, as long as we have a supply of, of solar energy and water. So the range we're talking about is up to 60 kilometers per day, of course, depending on the wind conditions. Uh, eight, uh, eight kilometers per hour airspeed, uh, relative airspeed. So if we have an eight kilometer per hour headwind, we're, we're just not going anywhere. Um, power is uh, during, in a power generation mode, which is a mode where the vehicle would approach, say, a rover and dock with it. And then it would shut down all of its systems and essentially act as a huge solar array because the surface area is, is, is very large. And, and it triple charge the rover or the experiment back up, and then after a couple of days uh, depart, it can, it can provide a lot of power in that, in that mode. And the altitude is sufficient to get uh, wide angle images up to possibly 10 kilometers with, with 50 to 70 percent of the max payload. So for the uh, science payload, this Starrow Airborne architecture provides mobility, it can transport assets. It could uh, serve as a power generation station for some existing assets. It would replenish, uh, serve as a communications relay. It could have a payload that's simply a high volume data relay and it connects up with existing experiments. <coughs> but most importantly, it provides in a single mission the ability to look from a, a, a wide angle and then within hours 
where you command the vehicle to get down there and start digging to find the golden egg. So implementation is architecture. We, we see in two or three missions you can get something like this running. Uh, the first mission would deploy a single power production unit and an explorer. This explorer, the first one, would be tailored specifically for maximum payload. It would be a transporter only. Uh, once it's inflated and is operational, the second mission would land three un uninflated explorers. Uh, the first transporter would go over and pick those up and bring those to the pellet production unit individually and have those inflated. This eliminates the need for precision landing near the propellant production unit. And in fact, it, the, the fact that you have transport capability reduces the need for precision, precision landing on a lot of future experiments. Um, <clears throat> there is a very large landing ellipse, uh, no matter how, how you, uh, you look at it, in terms of you can target a certain region, but you're not going to be able to land with pinpoint accuracy. So something like this will allow you to pick the payload up and move it to the pinpoint area where you really want it, that thing to be working at. Uh, so after two missions, we have one propellant production unit, a transporter, and three explorers that are often doing their, mi doing their mission. And we envision scientific payloads that were designed specifically for this architecture. So they would take advantage of the fact that power, mobility, and communication can be provided by the architecture, make these payloads a lot smaller, and you can send multiple science packages on one mission. And then finally, replenishment. Uh, additional vehicles can be sent uh, to, to continue exploration. So in summary, we, we looked at what the smart scientific community is doing. It's, they have really aggressive goals. Uh, and I think the only way we're going to get there is with a combination of increased mobility, endurance, and the ability to do remote and in situ sensing. Uh, but the key is we can do that, and we are doing that right now, but we're doing it with orbiters and landers and rovers and two years of, uh, of development between missions. Uh, the key is to be able to do this simultaneously. We need to provide the scientists that ability to to explore the way people would normally explore. So we've come up with this architecture, the Scarab Explorer architecture, which, which hinges on the ability to do in situ oxygen reduction, this inflatable, neutrally buoyant lifting surface vehicle, and the science payloads, which are designed specifically to address each of the missions. So finally, the, the Scarab Explorer concept we see as addressing these goals and being able to enable a rapid uh, exploration of Mars, the ability to, to really find those key discoveries that's, that would accelerate funding and exploration of Mars to the point where we would be sending <coughs> my son to Mars, your daughter, your nephew, and uh, maybe if we do this fast enough, we can send uh, Dr. Zuber to Mars too. So. <laughs> Thank you very much.
solar panels on top of your roof. Like that. That's true. Yeah, that's true. So how much power are you assuming the solar panels are? Uh, at peak power, we can get up to 45 kilowatts of service. Yeah, 45 kilowatts of peak power solar panels. Just big. That's a big system. That's the uh, number we're looking for. Yeah, that's uh, that's what we that's what we're envisioning for um, in terms of surface area on the on the upper surface. The upper surface is, is giant. We're not talking about these small rovers. But yeah, the upper surface. The meteorology, where the pressure cycle drives the winds in all around the directions of wind flow, at the Pathfinder and Viking sites don't have near as much relevance to polar regions. One of the predicted models, I think, for polar meteorology is that as long as there's a bare ice on the surface, there's a continual cold outflow from the bare ice at low altitudes. You may have to uh, fight that. There's been a good deal of modeling work of meteorology to understand how systems like polar ice cap edge dust storms and other things. Right. Um, I've been able to find a good model of winds on Mars that would provide uh, wind direction. Well, there, there are several world circulation models. Um, generally get the same answers. There's a huge deal as a huge deal. I'd love that. But it, it's true. We're not, we're not counting on the fact that we can get those similar performance uh, as measured by the Pathfinder. Uh, but and then the they they also have flow is going to be to get back to here. If you want to go and recharge getting back to something against that off You may have to do it. You may have to fly back in altitude. With his return flow. And yeah, what's the minimum weight of your entire uh, flight craft, and what's the <coughs> displacement that would be required in, on Mars to lift that? The FDOA we're talking is about uh, 180 kilograms without a total of like like uh, gross weight, minimum gross weight, including your payload. And all that. Well, we're, we're talking just over 200 kilograms for uh, for the vehicle itself. Uh, almost half of that is jump load. Uh, actually, a little bit more than half of the people do solar arrays on top of that. So the technology to be able to do flexible solar arrays and, and, and the envelope uh, is, is going to be key. Uh, we've looked at step you know, different approaches where we don't use the hydrogen, we use helium, we use more conventional technologies, and we get a very low payload capability, but still something that uh, can do a similar kind of mission, but uh, much less. Uh, What's the, what's the volume? Uh, we were talking about uh, some of the concepts we had were uh, 90,000 cubic feet uh, of hydrogen. Uh, is, you know, we're talking about, it's similar to a stratospheric or the ultra one ratio of balloons that, that would fly very high altitudes on Earth. That's the kind of performance that you would get on the surface of Mars. Are you counting on your flexible solar cells also being the structure on top? Is that why you need those? Because otherwise, you could just, like a transparent upper cover, just put folding solar cells beneath it. You wouldn't have to worry about the flexibility. That's not, we haven't been looking at it as structurally required, and we, we consider that, but you've got more losses as you go through uh, sort of transparent uh, region. But, uh, we, we, we didn't, uh, there was no requirement to have those on the other surfaces that don't need it the large surface area mm -hmm. solar. One of the ongoing problems uh, with uh, any sort of plastic envelope is that it deteriorates under the effect of uh, ultraviolet light. What kind of uh, mission life are you expecting? Well, we, uh, we haven't, uh, haven't looked at that too much, to be honest with you, except for the fact that uh, uh, solar rays kind of provide some, some type of uh, shielding. shielding to that extent. Actually, uh, plastic on Earth deteriorates in ultraviolet light because of the oxygen on Earth. Huh? When you go to really high altitude, these, these plastics last a long time. Oh, great. Any more questions? Go ahead, one more question. Why tie yourselves to the Pullman circuit? Go ahead, no, go ahead. Not have three. Okay. Yeah. What's the projected inflation period for the envelope? Uh, well, <clears throat> I'm talking probably the deployment uh, that would take 30, 35 days. And we're not talking as much propellant as. as say these propellant production units that want to create uh, liquid oxygen and, and hydrogen for uh, an ascent vehicle that would take a significant amount of time. We just need gaseous hydrogen, which uh, is, is, we're talking bar barrels of water instead of you know, the quantities that are required for an ascent vehicle. And 
Why tie yourself to the poles? Why not uh, just bring your water for the first time and just keep recycling it? And then you have to trickle charge to make up some of the lost water that you can actually get that from the atmosphere that folks at the University of Washington. Uh, that's one of the, one of the concepts that we're using. Okay. Last question. What kind of bus voltage are you looking at? Power system. I, I don't know. I had to get my colleagues here to talk about that. I, I'm, my background is an aerodynamicist. I was the lead aerodynamicist on X74 and uh, kind of new to the Mars stuff. I did some Mars airplane work and some uh, some other things as well. But uh, as far as the infrastructure and the electronics, I don't know. Thank you. Thanks.